Uh, very good evening to everyone. So without much this one, we'll directly go to the topic of the day. That's diabetic gastroparesis management, diagnosis and management. So gastroparesis literally means a gastric palsy. It's a pathological condition which is characterized objectively by objectively demonstrated delayed gastric emptying or absent gastric emptying in the absence of mechanical obstruction or ulceration. So this is important. So we need to rule out uh, obstruction as a cause of a delayed or uh, you know like a gastric emptying. So effectively, it is a, a neuromuscular condition. So the uh, gastroparesis could be idiopathic. It could be diabetic. That is the topic of the day. It could be post-surgery uh, because of the uh, injury uh, to the nerves, for example, uh, following CABG or, uh, you know, like actual vagotomy might have been done or some thoracic surgery might be done. So all these things also can uh, lead to uh, 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 neuropathic uh, uh, neurogenic gastroparesis. So uh, sometimes, you know, like uh, viruses like Epstein-Barr virus, et cetera, can also lead to uh, gastroparesis. Drug induced, we have a whole big list of drugs, uh, which uh, I will uh, uh, present to you as the presentation progresses further. Yeah, then there are some other rare causes uh, and may not be gastroparesis, also maybe functional uh, problems. So diabetic gastroparesis affects around 20 to 50 percent of the diabetic population, especially those with type 2 diabetes mellitus more than those with type 2. Uh, in type 2 diabetic patients, it is more seen in more long-standing uh, type 2 diabetes patients. The mean age of onset is approximately 34 years. A uh, single large uh, center study of uh, 146 gastroparesis patients, they had uh, around 29% uh, diabetes, 13% post-gastric surgery and 36% were idiopathic. So type 1 was more prevalent than type 2. And one thing that we need to understand is it often goes unrecognized. Female to male ratio is like uh, much more 4 is to 1. And in females, uh, uh, the gastroparesis cycle is a quick question. And you will get the answer later. It worsens in the luteal phase, possibly uh, due to progestational effect on the uh, uh, relaxation of the uh, autonomic, uh, uh, this one, like all the abdominal musculature, including the smooth muscles of the stomach and uh, gastrointestinal system. And uh, there is a definite association with poor glycemic control, whether it is for the short, acutely, or whether it is a long term uh, because of the pathogenic mechanisms. Uh, the normal gastric emptying results from integration of the tonic contractions of the fundus, basic contractions of the antrum, which is coordinated by the specialized pacemaker cells known as the interstitial cells of Kajal. So these cells are very important in uh, setting the uh, uh, pacemaking as well as the, the propagation of the uh, electrical impulse and coordination of the intrinsic uh, enteric nervous system with the extrinsic autonomic uh, nervous system thereby uh, you know like uh, setting the right pace of gastric emptying in a normal person so the physiological factors which affect uh, gastric emptying include uh, stomach distension which actually promote gastric emptying similarly liquid contents uh, uh, in, uh, are more rapidly uh, uh, transit from the stomach to the intestine smaller particle size faster the transit, parasympathetic stimulation stimulates uh, uh, the gastric emptying. On the other hand, uh, duodenal distension, uh, high uh, uh, acidic uh, chyme, fat or protein uh, content in the chyme will delay the gastric em emptying. Secretin and cholecystokinin hormones again uh, slow down the gastric emptying, as well as pain, anxiety, stress, and sympathetic stimulation can slow down the gastric, uh, gastric emptying. So these are the factors actually, which can actually, you know, like uh, what you can call slow down the gastric emptying further in a patient who already has a pathophysiology. There is something known as androduodenal uh, coordination. Uh, what happens is like uh, you can see here on the bottom, the proximal duodenal uh, contractions actually are lacking when there is a gastric emptying. So when the uh, 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 the pylorus uh, relaxes and the gastric and uh, the chyme enters the uh, intestine actually in squirts actually, uh, after grinding and mixing of the chyme, uh, at that point of time, there is a um, relaxation, there is a reciprocal relaxation in the duodenum to accommodate the food and propagate further. So there are a lot of uh, the, uh, the, you know, like physiological aspects to it. Uh, I think uh, we are talking about the diagnosis and management, so I will leave it here. So essentially, the pathophysiology involves neuromuscular abnormalities, whether it's predominantly neural or pre predominantly muscular in certain other cases of the gastric motor function, which ultimately leads to gastroparesis. 
So uh, the extrinsic denervation of my, uh, my stomach could be there, as I mentioned, because of surgical reasons, which delays the gastric emptying. The loss of nitric oxide synthase in the enteric nerves or the neurons themselves because of uh, uh, uncontrolled diabetes leads to decreased gastric accommodation and decreased anteral contractility and there can be pyelorospasm which can lead to delayed gastric emptying. Altered uh, immune uh, cell function uh, like uh, type 2 macrophage function uh, loss can also lead to loss of cytoprotective factors which can in turn lead to loss of the interstitial cells of casual casualopathy which can actually set the platform for gastric arrhythmias rather than coordinate with them, now there will be arrhythmic incoordinated contraction of the stomach which will uh, uh, which will take the food nowhere actually and lead to gastric retention smooth muscle atrophy whether it is because of the diabetes uh, per se or because of some other underlying additional causes may also worsen the uh, uh, gastroparesis so this is another important aspect with the glucogastric uh, equilibrium so like uh, uh, dr mamana was telling like the coordination between the specialties so here uh, there is a coordination between the two uh, to maintain the equilibrium and promote homeostasis so if you see there, when there is a postprandial hyperglycemia what happens uh, postprandial hyperglycemia the rate of gastric emptying is slowed down and vice versa there is a reactive or postprandial hypoglycemia and the rate of gastric emptying is enhanced so this is brought about by several hormones, including the cholestokinin, peptide YY, GLP-1, amylin, etc., which are released from the uh, pancreas, for example, amyl is co-secreted with insulin, whereas the uh, uh, incretins are secreted from the intestine, like uh, the caseles of the intestine. So all these actually have got a uh, negative feedback inhibition on the gastric emptying. And also they have got a uh, glucagonostatic and ins uh, insulinotropic effect, actually, to control, the regulate the blood sugar. So the both it is it is closely knit actually uh, acute hyperglycemia slows down the gastric emptying. So both of the this one mechanisms vice versa. Hyperglycemia slows down the gastric emptying. Hypoglycemia promotes I mean uh, gastric emptying. Similarly, you know like uh, the uh, uh, rapid gastric emptying can uh, can lead to uh, increased absorption of the glucose and can lead to hyperglycemia and can lead to osmotic imbalance and hypotension and all those things. So. Basically, there is a clo closely knit coordination between these systems. Uh, now, uh, leaving the, uh, you know, like uh, the uh, physiological aspects as aside, we'll come to the clinical evaluation of a patient with suspected diabetic gastroparesis. So the clinical features, you know, is one which mostly takes the patient uh, uh, to the doctor, to the physician or a gastroenterologist or an endocrinologist who is actually evaluating his uh, diabetes. The patient may present with nausea, vomiting, bloating and early satiation of the meals. Sometimes there could be episodic nausea and vomiting uh, which can happen in cycles. Patient can present with constipation or diarrhea. Sometimes the patient may be totally asymptomatic, you know, like uh, because there is afferent denervation associated with the vagal uh, denervation, there is afferent dysfunction also. Patient will not realize, I mean, you know, like complain anything, but the patient may present with impaired nutrition and weight loss. And sometimes, you know, like endoscopy is performed, uh, for the endoscopy is performed for some other reason. And then, you know, like uh, food is found, uh, stale food is found in the uh, stomach. So in such a scenario, one need to be cautious, you know, like uh, with respect to the time when the patient has taken food, which many times our patients uh, tend to, you know, like uh, may not tell it correctly. So then, of course, wide glycemic fluctuations, both hyper and hypoglycemia are a hallmark of gastroparesis because of the unpredictable uh, absorption of the nutrients from the gastrointestinal system. A careful medical history is very essential for the differential diagnosis. And also the timing in relation to meals can help us know like whether it is the predominantly the accommodation problem of the gastric fundus or whether it is predominantly the uh, blockage in the pylorus actually, whether it is an early or late symptom. So we need to explore how the patient's diabetes control is and symptoms that may suggest hypothyroidism we need to rule out that can cause uh, the, all the symptoms and history of any previous surgery and medications which might be often uh, forgotten or not mentioned. The patient may not uh, feel that you know the other medications which he is taking are important. Now coming to physical examination, uh, the surrogate uh, uh, clinical findings may help us like neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, abdominal distension, succussion, splash, actually, I mean, you know, like a clinician might watch for it, but then studies have shown it's not very sensitive uh, uh, sign after all. Foul breath, orthostatic, postural hypotension, these may be present. So uh, it, it is better to quantify the symptom severity so that, you know, like we can uh, chalk out a management plan for the patient. So this can be done by scoring systems, uh, which I'll come to later. 
before that uh, this is one slide you know like this is a crowded slide but it's very important to know i mean i may just glance through the drugs but we all need to know that there are many drugs which can actually delay gastric emptying uh, starting from opioid analgesics anticholinergic agents tricyclic antidepressants many patients are on this i mean it's soft forgotten calcium channel blockers progesterone octreotide proton pump inhibitor and h2 receptor antagonists interferon alpha l dopa even fiber you know like uh, high fiber diet sucralfate aluminum hydroxide and other antacids beta receptor agonists glucagon calcitonin dexfenfluramine dexfenhydramine which might be used for uh, appetite suppression alcohol tobacco nicotine in other forms and antimuscarinics like atropine and glycopyridine so the list is really long so we need to be aware of this uh, when uh, we are evaluating the patient because it might be drug uh, drug related uh, uh, delayed gastric emptying not uh, uh what you can call uh, anatomical gastroparesis per se this is a scoring system uh, which has been developed uh, to objectively assess uh, the severity of uh, gastroparesis the basically it's a nine symptom criteria from a scale of 0 to 5 so based on laker scale like you know like uh, the slider you know like uh, like as you can see here the smile is like you know uh, the symptom doesn't exist or it is the worst at it uh, at its worst nausea or vomiting again you score 0 to 5 nausea reaching vomiting postprandial fullness or early satiety again you have got stomach fullness not able to finish a normal meal feeling excessively full after meal loss of appetite bloating again you know like bloating and uh, stomach visibility larger again you score 0 to 5 so you know like uh, based on this you can have you know like uh, when we start at, uh, any treatment or intervention or over a period of time you can make out you know like whether the uh, symptoms are progressing uh, i mean becomes wor becoming worse or they are getting better or they have remained static there is another uh, uh, functional uh, scoring system gastroparesis severity based on the uh, i mean scoring based on the severity of the illness so like grade 1 where you know like mild intermittent symptoms are there and uh, this can be controlled with diet modification and avoidance of the exacerbating agents grade 2 where the patient has moderately severe symptoms but no weight loss no major nutrient deficiency and patient can be managed with prokinetic drugs plus antiemetic drugs uh, whereas grade 3 is the most severe form refractory to medications unable to maintain oral nutrition malnutrition is there frequent emergency room visits requiring iv fluid medication and you know like uh, you need to mobilize the army all whatever you have got on your treatment armamentarium you need to uh, bring it to the table uh, to try and help the patient so it can be challenging so like accor accordingly the treatment ca plan can be chalked out so what are the complications of diabetic gastroparesis the mainly the, uh, the complications are local you know like uh, but uh, we, need, we should not ignore the systemic complications also locally like there could be esophagitis malaria waste tear from repeated retching vomiting malnutrition can happen both micro macronutrient bone health can be affected volume depletion can lead to even epitoneal failure particularly the diabetics already they have got nephropathy because you know like it's a, a predominantly because of the uh, autonomic neuropathy so they also have other microvascular complications electrolyte disturbances can happen bizarre formation we need to remember that itself can worsen the whole scenario hyperglycemic energy uh, emergencies are much more common in these patients including dk Uh, hyperosmolic uh, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome and hypoglycemia can happen depending upon whether the patient is a type 1 or type 2 diabetic so coming to the diagnosis uh, the symptoms which i already mentioned uh, will uh, you know like uh, direct us uh, towards the uh, diagnosis as well as help us uh, investigate in a proper direction to exclude other causes of course we need to exclude mechanical obstruction and incriminating drugs laboratory studies actually uh, are directed based on what you are suspecting clinically what you want to rule out clinically but essentially a cbc a complete blood count esr a metabolic panel ana rheumatoid factor because sometimes autoimmune diseases also can lead to uh, these problems uh, thyroid stimulating hormone hypothyroidism we need to rule out uh, i mean uh, urinalysis can be done so all these things you know like help us in ruling out any other secondary uh, factors an upper gi endoscopy or uh, uh, nuclear imaging uh, can be done Uh, to exclude the presence of uh, stricture mass or ulcer so we need to exclude these at all costs before further specific diagnostic imaging uh, for gastroparesis which include radiographic tests that is gastric scintigraphy where a radio labeled solid meal is uh, given this is the gold standard 99m technetium sulfur colloid labeled low fat egg white meal is given uh, of course there are so many variants of this uh, each center probably has got their own expertise and experience in what protocol they follow and how they interpret it but there is some generalized uh, this one which has been published which i am going to go through 
because personally i don't have much uh, experience uh, with uh, these uh, modalities of investigation so before we uh, subject the patient to undergo this test at all costs we need to exclude obstruction and stop any motility altering medications at least you know uh, three four days we need to stop and if the patient is on uh, glp1 receptor agonists which are long acting then you know like we need to stop at least 7 to 10 days prior to undertaking the procedure smoking alcohol should be uh, at all costs avoided on the day and at least one day prior hyperglycemia in the presence of hyperglycemia that itself can uh, uh, slow down the gastric motility and lead to false positive we need to control the hyperglycemia before we undertake this test and the patient should be fasting now that is done uh, standardized test meal is consumed quickly within 10 minutes and sequential imaging is done with the gamma camera anteriorly and posteriorly over the stomach area at baseline uh, and up to 4 hours shortening the uh, Im uh, imaging uh, time can lead to false diagnosis uh, that is why 4 hour uh, what they say uh, imaging is absolutely essential and the results are expressed with the percentage of predictability retained in the stomach each at each time point so if there is a retention of more than 60% at 2 hour or more than 10% at 4 hours then we are going to label as gastroparesis so here you can see that you know like in a normal person almost everything is actually evacuated from the stomach whereas in this uh, delayed gastric emptying you can see here like 57 percent so basically significant amount is retained at uh, uh, four hours so radio opaque markers can be used like a, i mean simple thing actually 10 small pieces of nasogastric tubing you cut up and uh, ingest with a meal and uh, no marker should remain in the stomach more than six hours looks very simple test but it has limitations what is the standardization of the meal what is the size of the marker all those things actually can uh, lead to variable results and suppose the markers are uh, uh, imaged in the intestines let's say uh, uh, a small bowel loop lying or in a transverse colon we will not be able to make out whether it is in the uh, retained in the stomach or actually it's in the colon so there are limitations with this procedure but uh, yeah it can be you know like uh, done uh, quite easily and if it is unequivocally abnormal, yes, we can arrive at a diagnosis. Ultrasonography has a limited role, actually, transabdominal ultrasound. We can actually make out the cross-sectional uh, area and calculate the gastric volume at various time frames. But operatory independence is the uh, dependency is there. And also, this is uh, mainly reliable for liquid emptying. So, uh, whereas gastroparesis is all about uh, emptying of uh, solids from the uh, uh, stomach. So 3D ultrasound is supposed to improve over this. It's a newer modality, but uh, still it's not like an established uh, treatment. Uh, the main usefulness may be in pregnant women and children where you need to avoid radiation exposure. MRI, again, you know, like you can image the antral propagation waves, you can calculate the volumes and uh, solid markers can be uh, used, which are uh, uh, opaque to the MRI and we can measure the solid meal emptying. So the main drawback is the availability, the expense of the test and lack of availability of the software and expertise to conduct this test. So not widely used. Then we have the stable isotope gastric emptying breath testing. So what we do here is a 13C uh, carbon, which is not uh, radioactive, uh, octanoic acid or spirin platensis, which is a blue-green algae, is used as uh, is used. And the uh, advantage of using the stable isotope is there is no radiation. The patient ingests the meal and after eight hours of uh, fasting, this is done and samples of the exhaled air are collected and the ratio of uh, stable, the usual carbon isotope to 13C is measured over 240 minutes. So there are several protocols are there, but the disadvantage is that it's unreliable in those who are having absorption problems because you are measuring from the breath, you are assuming absorption is uh, unhampered. So absorption uh, is directly proportional to the gastric emptying. That is the underlying principle. If the underlying principle is violated either because of pancreatic insufficiency, malabsorption or uh, lung disease, COPD, then this test becomes unreliable. So this has a limitation. So that is why it is you know, like not used as a first line uh, test actually. Then we have got the wireless motility capsule. Wireless motility capsule is a small ingestible capsule which has got uh, electronics and transmitter in it. And uh, after two to five days, it is evacuated uh, from the bowel. And uh, uh, during this time, it will uh, record several parameters, including pH, pressure, temperature, and all that. So by uh, measuring the pH, because stomach is highly acidic, as you can see here on the right hand side, the stomach is highly acidic, whereas the duodenum is uh, not. So by that, we can make out when the capsule has passed the stomach. So retention more than five hours implies uh, delayed gastric emptying. The uh, uh, disadvantage of this is the cost and scarce availability of the capsule. And uh, if there is a gastric pacemaker implanted, then it cannot be used. Similarly, the patient has got esophageal strictures, 
or even small bevel or large bevel structures and all no then it is not advisable because it can get retained and might require surgical extrication electro gastrography is another uh, procedure where actually you know the myoelectrical uh, activity of the stomach is uh, measured by using the electrodes which are positioned along the long axis of the uh, stomach so again you know like lot of electronics and all funda is involved you know to make this uh, uh, what you can call interfering uh, signals to be subtracted and all that so that itself leads to loss of some uh, uh, signal information and all that so uh, to uh, circumvent that uh, there are newer modalities where you know like uh, disposable uh, tra uh, tra transmitting electrode actually is uh, swallowed and you know like endoscopically uh, electrode is placed so many newer uh, modalities are coming up but you know like uh, still these are on the infancy or i would say the early development stage and uh, their role in uh, actual clinical workup is uh, still not very clear as per the guidelines androdiodal manometry androdiodal manometry you know like uh, what happens is we are measuring the pressures food ingestion actually you know uh, triggers uh, the regular antral and duodenal uh, rhythm for uh, propagating the food anterograde whereas in the interdigestive uh, phase the migratory motor complex is uh, happening which is repeated every 2 hours if there is a alteration in this actually if there is a arrhythmia or that uh, thing we can make out also uh, depending upon the type of uh, you know like the type of uh, uh, pr pressure waves we can make out you know like the abnormal contractions whether it is uh, myopathic type uh, characterized by low amplitude of contractile activity which can happen in uh, certain diseases like uh, systemic sclerosis and amyloidosis versus uh, typically what happens with uh, neurological disorders whether it's autonomic neuropathy because of diabetes or other neurological causes so we can distinguish uh, between them it can help uh, in differential uh, diagnosis just a slide actually here at flow chart uh, how to diagnose this patient a patient presents with symptoms uh, and physical examination findings we rule out any drugs delaying gastric emptying laboratory test to rule out other diseases and arrive at uh, any other differential diagnosis then esophago gastroduodenoscopy or double contrast upper gastrointestinal radiography to rule out obstruction ulceration then we are going for a, a, a gastric emptying scintigraphy which i told or a breath test uh, if you diagnose uh, then that will lead to a diagnosis of uh, gastroparesis or otherwise additional test which may be potentially useful which i already mentioned why uh, the wireless capsule or uh, this uh, 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 and in nasogastric uh, tube uh, uh, pieces uh, emptying or uh, elasto gastrography and and antro duodenal manometry so we arrive at a diagnosis we clinically score the patient how severe it is and then we are going to manage the patient so this is just a slide which uh, is presenting the differential diagnosis of gastroparesis as a, re a recap so patient may present with symptoms suggest of gastroparesis actually but uh, you may not diagnose one the patient may be having some other condition like rumination syndrome cyclical vomiting syndrome patient may be pregnant and <laughs> having morning sickness patient may be having celiac disease gastric outlet obstruction complete or partial small bowel obstruction large bowel obstruction crohn's disease bowel structure hypothyroidism diabetes with or without ketoacidosis functional dyspepsia cns disorder particularly the med medullary disorders uh, like uh, progressive uh, supranuclear palsy patient may be having adrenal insufficiency patient may be having uh, so, uh, medications uh, the long list which i mentioned or patient may be actually addicted to ca cannabinoids and having cannabinoid hyperemesis uh, uh, syndrome which is uh, uh, supposed to be typically relieved by taking a hot water bath and uh, patient may be having a pseudo bowel obstruction or it may be functional like uh, i mean psychiatric illness like anorexia or bulimia nervosa patient may be actually inducing Uh, vomiting so we need to be aware that the differential diagnosis is large so if we are uh, if our uh, investigations modalities uh, do, don't suggest any gastric emptying abnormalities we need to keep this in mind just because a patient is diabetic doesn't mean that uh, his gastroparesis uh, necessarily be diabetic gastroparesis or even gastroparesis at all we need to keep that very much in mind in uh, diagnosing these patients now coming to the last part of my talk that's the treatment which is nonetheless very important so the approach would be you know like uh, uh, what is the cause of di di diabetic gastroparesis it is a diabetes so glycemic control is very important uh, not only that we need to address other aspects also so as actually today's uh, uh, you know like platform so interdisciplinary approach is very important a team of specialists is required primary care physician gastroenterologist endocrinologist dietitian psychologist uh, behavior therapist interventional radiologist surgeon so all have got their role to play uh, you know like to help the patient with this very difficult challenging condition so 
in addition to glycemic control endocrinologists also will have to address other uh, this one like uh, mineral micronutrient vitamin deficiency bone mass hypogonadism amenorrhea which can be associated with all the nutritional and other uh, uh, problems which these patients have coming to the nutritional management a bird bird's eye view of nutrition management uh, like what we typically say for diabetic high fiber diet and all that may not be appropriate here uh, because it can actually worsen the gas uh, i mean gastric emptying hydration uh, oral hydration if it doesn't hap happen at all then we probably you know like uh, can go for uh, pure liquids uh, in between uh, the meals or you can even go for iv hydration parental nutrition for a time being meal volume actually you know like you can increase the frequency and divide the portion size so that you know emptying becomes more easy there is less retention and uh, if the patient cannot chew blenderize pulverize make it into small bits so that it can empty more easily glycemic control yes match meals with the medicines uh, so as to avoid both hyper hypoglycemia when it comes to fat less is more fiber watch for fur balls you know like if you give a lot of fibers it can end up in bizarre formation and more problems micronutrient deficiencies bones blood we need to see whether the patient has got anemia as anecdotally high vitamin b12 also can b12 also can decrease gastric emptying it seems as per one study don't know more about it but yeah, there is some study like that and uh, yeah we need to watch the weight and body mass index patient is not getting uh, wasted malnourished avoid also foods which actually lower esophageal uh, sphincter pressure which are lower you know such foods you need to avoid because again you know one side is already the stomach has problem other and we don't want to create problem and reflex esophagitis and all that we don't want so avoid peppermint chocolate fat caffeine uh, alcohol tobacco stress avoid chewing gum which increases ear swallowing and uh, leads to more uh, distension uh, like the meal time can be prolonged you know like they say 30 minute meals oral dental hygiene also goes a long way in preventing secondary infection candidiasis and all that now when uh, when it comes to glycemic management this is our forte as endocrinologists but then you know like i will not go uh, too much into it i think the crowd is uh, mainly endocrine crowd here hyperglycemia we know per se delays ga gastric emptying beyond whatever it causes to the autonomic neuropathy the icc interstitial cells of casal casalopathy everything so hyperglycemia has to be controlled and the dipic 4 inhibitors they have not been shown to have any major effect on gastric emptying but nevertheless we need to be cautious sglt 2 inhibitors uh, seem to be the game changer because you know they don't cause your, your uh, hypoglycemia and all that so they are uh, insulin independent uh, relatively but then you need to understand one problem with this that patient should not get dehydrated you know like because if the gastroparesis is severe then that can be a problem alpha glucosidase inhibitor we need to be very cautious because uh, per se they can cause uh, worsen the bloating and all that but then you know there are some anecdotal uh, experts can actually dwell into this area and see if uh, actually by causing you know rapid transit from the small intestine the feedback inhibition for the gastric emptying sometimes it can prevent so in a initial odd patient it may help but in general the word is caution avoid for alpha glucosidase inhibitors intratin mimetics of course they delay gastric emptying and uh, better to avoid that in this scenario insulin therapy is the sheet anchor particularly the basal bolus regimen uh, a newer knee is not always better actually regular insulin human insulin may score over short acting analogs because you know the delayed action is probably what we want here because the emptying is uh, slow we can even give the insulin prandial insulin after the meals so that as to match the peak of the insulin with the absorption multiple small meals aggressive glucose monitoring with smbg or even technologies like cgms and multiple small doses or uh, insulin pump can help in uh, difficult cases sensor augmented pump also can probably help in these cases and if you are using just a simple C csi simple uh, uh, insulin pump then we can explore square wave combo or dual wave boluses to which uh, can help match the caloric absorption and uh, uh, so that we can at least uh, uh reduce the wild swings of uh, glycine of both hyper and hypo now coming to the proper pharmacologic treatment of uh, gastroparesis uh, uh, i'm sure the gastroenterologists on the board are more uh, comfortable with these medications we are not much into it uh, but anyway so prokinetics are the first class of medica medications when it comes to the metoclopramide domperidone erythromycin cisapride and etopride so the metoclopramide domperidone uh, these uh, act by the dopaminergic uh, pathway antagonists and uh, the uh, uh, there are newer prokinetic agents which are like tegaserol sildenafil has been tried abt229 gm611 they are all investigation agents synthetic gr uh, ghrelin as well as ghrelin agonist like remarol renin betalinol levosulfide clonidin all been tried in difficult resistant cases coming to our you know first drug that is metoclopramide uh, what advice has been given is to limit to 40 mg per day 
to avoid uh, dystonia is much more common in younger females and uh, the black box warning is there and uh, what uh, the uh, us fda suggests is limit to 3 months uh, therapy if possible to avoid uh, tardive dyskinesia there have been lot of lawsuits related to this i suppose it can cause gynecomastia and galactoria it can prolong the qtc and can lead to arrhythmias may provoke uncontrolled hypertension or mask latent underlying primary hyperaldosteronism we need to be cautious about that part also and uh, domperidone very similar to metoclopramide but uh, less uh, cns effects because less crossing of the blood brain barrier uh, but nevertheless the profile is uh, similar it's available in india and in many countries it's not available cisapride etopride these act on different pathways of ht4 agonist again the risk of ventricular arrhythmias all these things are there we lesser with etopride compared to cisapride i think mosapride was withdrawn for uh, that purpose of uh, prolonging the qt interval erythromycin again you know like uh, there are the similar risks uh, actually when it comes to the cardiac uh, this one uh, oral erythromycin is administered in the range of 50 to 100 mg thrice a day it can actually act on the motilin receptors and enhance gastric emptying uh, intravenous erythromycin can be a day saver in, ca in acute cases but uh, we need to remember that uh, there is tachyphylaxis uh, to this uh, uh, prokinetic uh, effect of uh, the macrolides antiemetics uh, whether it is the ondansetron or whether phenothiazine uh, can all be uh, you know like uh, used for uh, symptom control of course then there are you know other therapies which are available uh, which are like uh, not mainstream but then extreme cases uh, demand extreme treatments intrapyloric botulinum injection uh, this has been proposed for the predominant pylorospasm mechanism of uh, gastroparesis there is no unequivocal evidence there are like some studies which are showing it's beneficial so yes depending upon the expertise and the uh, personal experience of the uh, gastroenterologist uh, may be tried pyeloplasty instead of uh, this injection one can go for surgical or endoscopic peroral endoscopic myotomy of the pylorus to uh, uh, improve the uh, emptying of the stomach uh, uh, along with or uh, without that stenting uh, transpyloric stenting can also be done endoscopically again there is not much evidence of uh, benefit some uh, single st center studies have sh been uh, watching for it but uh, some others have not shown the consistent benefit gastric electrical stimulation can be done which uh, actually can improve nausea quality of life nutritional status in patients with refractory gastroparesis where nothing else is working it can be done uh, by high frequency electrical uh, stimulation uh, pacing this uh, this is the only one which has been approved by the fda and uh, there are several other means of uh, stimulation like gastric electrical pacing uh, like uh, sensing the uh, this one uh, both the sensors and the pacers uh, electrodes are placed and you know like sequentially the stomach is paced and uh, sequ uh, the, all these things are uh, done but again you know like uh, uh, we don't have much uh, you know like evidence for all this uh, treatment that in, that it works in every patient and uh, of course they are all costly technologies and may not be widely available so what what else surgery surgery is the last resort for decompressing the stomach and also providing an access to enteral nutrition like venting gastrostomy or jejunostomy can be done so uh, the risk of complications is high so it's uh, used as a last resort you know like infection so many problems can happen uh, if the stomach is a problem we remove it you know gastrectomy and bypass all these things have been tried in extreme cases then there there are some experimental therapies like stem cell treatment uh, of uh, interstitial cells of casual casualopathy is there so you uh, uh, I mean, I mean, try to rejuvenate the icc but these are all you know like experimental not much success has been there so maybe this may be the future to come who knows interleukin 10 also has been tried but uh, these are all in the preliminary phase studies so i think with that i'll try to summarize like uh, uh, the presentation what i made now gastrointestinal manifestations are frequent in diabetes diabetes may not be the cause of gastrointestinal symptoms not all upper gastrointestinal symptoms are gastro, uh, are due to gastroparesis uh, even in a patient with gastroparesis uh, there may be additional factors uh, which may be responsible for the delayed gastric emptying glycemia influences the development of neuropathy not only that even acutely it changes gastric emptying extrinsic and enteric neuropathies are the key mechanisms along with casualopathy uh, which comes in between 99m technician scintigraphy uh, study is the gold standard the treatment should be tailored depending upon the severity and it includes better diabetic control dietary modification prokinetic agents 
artificial nutri nutrition in whatever form it takes endoscopic uh, uh, therapeutic modalities electrical stimulation or surgery in required cases with that i come to the end of uh, my talk thank you thank you